<笑>鬼岛之音 ，Ghost Island Media。Hi everyone, Emily Wai Wu here. There's been a rise in COVID cases in Taiwan, but we are holding strong. So thank you to everybody who's reached out to us. And today on the Taiwan Take, we have a special episode for you. Well, every episode is special, but today is especially special because today's interview is done in collaboration with Ghost Island Media's other podcast called Waste Not Why Not. Waste Not Why Not is a show on the climate and the environment. It's hosted by Nate Maynard, a sustainability consultant based in Taiwan. Today, Nate interviews Davafell, a political scientist at SOAS University of London. Davafell is the author of the new book, Taiwan's Green Party: Alternative Politics in Taiwan, published in March 2021. Take it away, Nate. In 2019, the European Parliament witnessed what was called a green wave, and Green Party candidates had won 69 seats across 15 countries, from Finland to Spain, from Austria to the UK. The next year, municipal elections in France saw yet another green surge, and the Greens in Germany are polling as the nation's number two party, second only to Merkel's ruling Conservatives. All over the world, there are 91 green parties that believe in committing our governments to environmental stewardship through the election of green political parties. In Asia, Green Party Taiwan has been running ambitious campaigns for more than 20 years. In 2020, it ran again with the goal of bringing more environmental voices into parliament. Yet, unlike its European counterparts, Green Party Taiwan came out with mixed results. Are green parties finally on the rise as countries scramble to achieve carbon neutrality? Or, as in the U.S., are they still seen as a petty venture that only takes away votes from the mainstream left? The political and social impacts of green parties is a global issue, and this is the Taiwan Take. We're speaking today with Professor David Fell, who just published a book on green parties in Taiwan. The book is titled "Taiwan's Green Parties: Alternative Politics in Taiwan." Welcome to the show, Professor Fell. Yeah, it's a pleasure to finally actually join one of your shows. Yeah, happy to have you on. It's a pleasure for me to be a host finally for the Taiwan Take. <laughs> <laughs> How are you today? Fantastic. It's、um, nice to kind of be in Taiwan in this way, even though I can't physically be there. Yeah, your pixel images are here in Taiwan at least, and your voice is here <laughs> in Taiwan. Could you introduce yourself? Okay, hi there. My name is David Fell. I work at SOAS University of London in the politics department. And I run the Center of Taiwan Studies for yeah almost twenty years now. I've been a fan of Taiwan since I was an undergrad student in Taiwan in nineteen eighty nine, nineteen ninety. I lived in Taiwan for most of the nineteen nineties as a bushi band teacher, and I even did a radio show back in Kaohsiung in those days. And I still come back as often as I can. That's awesome. What was Taiwan like in the nineties? I think it was a really fascinating place. I think there was a lot of optimism at that point in time. That things were really getting better. Things like democratization, introduction of national health insurance. It was an exciting time to be in Taiwan when things were really changing and changing fast. So, how did you get into the Green Parties? How did you start studying the Taiwan Green Party? Was this you were here in the '90s? Did it start back then?、Um, I wasn't particularly aware of the Green Party at that point of time when I was、uh, living in Taiwan. It was a kind of a gradual process. In my first book, Party Politics in Taiwan, I'd looked at the two main parties, DPP and KMT. But my third party case was the New Party, and that was what really got me interested in small parties、mm. because the New Party seemed to act so irrationally. I just couldn't figure out why would you do something that's political suicide. But it was really not until 2012 when I started this current project. I had a student who went on to be the convener or co-convener of the Green Party. A couple of months after graduating, she went on to stand as a candidate in the 2012 elections. Wow. Okay, that's that's fast. <laughs> With no basically no preparation, she could stand as a parliamentary candidate. I thought that was really fascinating. And then later on, she invited me to get involved in researching the party. And as soon as we did the first kind of focus group, I was so hooked. These people are so different from the kind of mainstream politicians that I was used to working with. So passionate, idealistic,、uh, arguing a lot. <laughs> Not always very good at, at working together. So I was building up so much interesting data that I, I had to turn it into a book. And the book was actually too long. The publishers weren't very happy about the length of the book. <laughs> But I really enjoyed the process of putting this this book together.
And before we get into the details of your book, you know, for listeners who might not be that familiar with green parties, what are green parties? Is there like a green party manual? Like how do all these green parties get set up? I mean, they have their kind of six core values, which Taiwan Green Party has put a lot of stress on. Uh, There's environmentalism, there's grassroots democracy, sustainability. And I think that helps kind of bring them together. I think in many ways, the Taiwan Green Party is the most international party in Taiwan Hmm. because it really takes the that kind of international diplomacy seriously. And the Green Party was quite influential in the establishment of the Asia Pacific Greens, which was a network of uh, Asian Green Parties. Hmm. It was a key kind of founding member. Interesting. So Green Parties, I think, are a really interesting phenomenon. I think they bring something quite alternative into the political scene, no matter which country we're looking at. And in a way, studying Taiwan's Green Party is a way of kind of making Taiwan interesting to audiences that would not necessarily be interested right. in Taiwan. I'm living in the UK, where in some ways, actually, Taiwan's Green Party has been more successful than the uh, UK Green Party. Hmm. The UK Green Party took something like three or four decades to get into parliament, while Taiwan's Green Party won its first national parliamentary seat less than two months after the party was established. Wow, I didn't realize that. And in the process of doing the book, I found that a lot of activists actually found green diplomacy much more rewarding than Taiwanese politics. That kind of international engagement was very, very enjoyable and meaningful. And I think it's also a way that Taiwan can kind of reach out because Taiwan's Green Party can join these international organizations as a full member. And there's no China Green Party in the Global Greens yet. So they actually (laughs) have an advantage over China. Wow. One of the few international arenas where Taiwan is ahead of China and they're able to uh, play kind of a convening role, it sounds like, regionally. And I noticed that in the title, it says Taiwan's Green Parties. So this isn't just about the Green Party. So why do you have this plural title? Well, one of the things I mentioned earlier was that um, environmental activists are quite good at arguing. Yes. uh, And falling out with each other. So a lot of stories of, I think internationally, Green Party is often split. Mm. So Taiwan isn't an exception. So I have a chapter where I talk about party formation. And there I talk about three different parties. I talk about a, a stillborn Green Party that's formed, gets TV attention, but disappears. Hmm. The second Green Party is the one that we particularly know. And the third one is the Trees Party, which was a splinter off the main Green Party in 2014. That actually becomes another member of the Global Greens Party Network. But uh, last year, that party officially dissolved. Yeah, a lot of those environmentalists don't tend to agree, and we we enjoy arguing with ourselves. (laughs) So uh, I could totally see that manifesting for a political party. But how did the Green Party in Taiwan actually first get established? Was it just some idea someone had? How did this first happen? Well, I think it's linked with the evolution of Taiwan's civil society in the early to mid-1990s. A lot of civil society groups had very close connections with the DPP. Mm. It was the first major opposition party that was established in Taiwan. And by the mid-1990s, I think a lot of activists realized that the DP was not sincere on a lot of social and environmental issues, that, that they needed to find a little bit of autonomy to have their own political voice, particularly on nuclear energy, which is a, such a topical issue even today. So that was one of the things, there was distrust of the DBP at that point in time. That's at the root of the formation of the party. But it's always been a tricky balancing act because the DDP is more anti-nuclear than the KMT. Right. It does tend to be more progressive on a lot of issues. But essentially, the party is established January 1996, just before the presidential and national assembly elections in March 1996. And so it's pushing a anti-nuclear referendum that's held on the same day as the presidential election. So you can see the kind of linkage Mm. with what's going on in Taiwan today. Yeah, I was going to say this sounds familiar. I mean, now we're kind of in like the opposite space because there's a referendum for pro-nuclear and we're still talking about the fourth nuclear power plant, which I think was what they were talking about back then in 1996, right? That's right. Yeah, I mean, there was some such interesting uh, links. So we ha- there were local referendums, but there were non-binding referendums in Taipei County in, I think, 94 and then Taipei City in 1996. For a long time, I think one of the key Green Party goals was a national referendum on the fourth nuclear power station. They thought that was what would make them big on the political scene. But now we have one in 2021. Whether it's going to have that desired effect is hard to say. Yeah, we can definitely talk more about nuclear later. (laughs) So the Green Party started in 1996, and I read in a book that 
a green leader from the UK had flown to Taiwan. Was other international green parties, did they help set up the green party in Taiwan or was it more of a domestically decided formation? I would say it was definitely a domestically decided formation. There were linkages to that rise in student activism that we associate with the wild lilies. Mm. And they worked together with environmental leaders such as Taiwan Environment Protection Union. Mm. So I would say the formation was domestic. But very quickly, they're creating these international alliances. So during that first campaign, so just a couple of weeks after the party is established, Penny Kemp, who was a Green Party leader of England and Wales, came to Taipei to support the Taiwan Green Party. And a lot of these conversations continued as a number of those activists then go and visit the UK later on in 96. Interesting. Uh, They also create a linkage with the Australian Greens also in that first year. So Bob Brown from the Australian Greens, I think also visits Taiwan. Mm. And actually in some ways, Taiwan is ahead of its Asian partners because I think the Taiwan Greens are established earlier than the Korean or the Japanese Greens. Mm. Because we tend to think about Japan and Korea as slightly older democracies than Taiwan. But in this respect, Taiwan is established earlier. And a Taiwanese figure does go on to become the convener of the Global Greens Network. Huh. Again, it shows the way that Taiwan can influence the world through green diplomacy. There was also like a Japan-Korea-Taiwan statement on Hong Kong, sort of kind of transcending environment, this sort of international cooperation. Yes, I mean, I think that's true. I think the Greens have tried to bring in Taiwan's international status to their activism. And I think even from the start, back in 1996, the leader of the party went out into the missile zone. Wow during the kind of Chinese missile tests just to show that he was as strong on China as the KMT or the DUP. And that was one of the things that actually catches international media attention. The BBC reports on this. And this is how international Green Party suddenly became aware that there was a Taiwan Green Party. Hmm. And I think that in a number of these kind of global Greens conferences, Taiwan's Green Party has raised resolutions on these issues of Taiwan's self-determination and the threat from China. And I think you're right that the Hong Kong issue is again one that has kind of unified Asian Green Parties. Yeah, I mean, the Green Party sounds like they're, they're doing a lot. There's a lot of regional cooperation. I'm an environmental researcher, you know, so I'm always interested in like empirically speaking, what was the environmental impact of the Green Party in Taiwan? Because we were talking about the sort of the fourth nuclear reactor. For people who don't know, this was the fourth planned nuclear reactor in Taiwan that was never really built and is now a source of very tense political struggle. So obviously the Green Party didn't prevent by themselves the nuclear power plant. What's sort of like the environmental impact or the environmental legacy of Green Party Taiwan then? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. And it kind of links in with a question about how do we understand success of small niche parties? Mm. We can't put everything down to electoral success. I think for these kind of political parties that have a blurred boundary between social movements and political parties, just getting these issues on the agenda just getting them talked about. Can they actually, through this kind of debate, can public opinion change? And I would say that in the 90s and even in the early 2000s, public opinion really was quite pro-nuclear. It was it had a much more economic development first. Right. And I think that changed over time, even though, of course, I'm a bit concerned about these upcoming referendums. But I think that is one mark of success. Hmm. And if we compare this with nuclear energy in the UK, then the contrast is really scary because we're kind of going ahead with another generation of nuclear power stations. We, at least that's what our government tells us. And there's very little opposition compared to what we see in Taiwan. And we've been talking about this fourth nuclear power station for, what, three decades now. (laughs) But if we think back to the authoritarian era, three nuclear power stations were introduced without any kind of debate in the 70s and 80s in Taiwan. Right. But they've been able to kind of at least put this fourth one on hold. The idea of brand new nuclear power stations, I think, is more or less out of question in Taiwan. Yeah. I remember a few years ago, I did a, um, a session with a UK campaign for nuclear disarmament group. So it was a group of people who had basically no knowledge about Taiwan. And we screened a film, a Taiwanese documentary called Gong Liao Ni Hao Ma, How Are You Gong Liao? Okay. Which is about uh, local anti-nuclear activism in the town of Gong Liao in New Taipei City. And I'd never seen an audience so moved to tears and clapping through the film. And of course, the film finishes, I think, in maybe 2001. So after they've carried on construction of the power station. Uh, But I was able to then talk through how the anti-nuclear movement has developed, for example, during the Sunflower Movement, mothballing the power station. 
it's such an inspirational story to see the way that anti-nuclear activists have been able to work together with political parties to create broader alliances in Taiwan. I think there's a lot that the UK anti-nuclear movement could learn from the Taiwan case. Hey, from all of us at Ghost Island Media. We hope you're enjoying this episode. The goal of the Taiwan Take is to bring you in-depth conversations on matters important to Taiwan and as they relate to the world. We were recently nominated for a News Podcast Award at the Excellent Journalism Award in Taiwan. To help us speak to more people, donate to us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Taiwan. Now back to the show. You know... Just as a person living in Taiwan, it's been interesting to watch renewable energy go from, not zero, there was, you know, hydropower and things like that, but there was very limited wind and solar six years ago to now having a 25% renewable energy goal for electricity and sort of seeing that growth just in a very short period of time. But then part of that package was also natural gas, right? Taiwan has a goal for 50% natural gas from their electricity consumption. And there's now this algal reef, which is kind of becoming another fourth nuclear power plant in terms of opposition and sort of dividing political conflicts. For people who don't know, the Taoyuan algal reef controversy is related to a natural gas terminal that is proposed to be established in Taoyuan on a very ecologically significant space of algal reef, which is not like a coral reef. It is covered in algae and rocks. So this natural gas plant is critical for the nation's energy goals. It is also critical for the nation's biodiversity. I know the Green Party was involved sort of controversially with the algal reef. Is that something you've explored much in your research? Um, yeah, I mean, that issue starts to come up, I think, 2017, 2018. And the issue was quite damaging to the party. Mm. One of the party figures was quite critical of that movement. That was the starting point of the disconnect between the party and a lot of its traditional supporters. And I think one of the things that the party really needs to do after 2020 is to kind of mend those bridges mm. with those kind of social movement groups. And I think it's really difficult. Once you've broken those ties, how do you kind of reconnect with social movement groups? Yeah, And it's a constant kind of balancing act for these kind of environmental parties between electability and staying true to your kind of core values. And I think with the Alga Reef case, what complicates it is by taking a stance in support of the, the algal reef campaign with the KMT kind of joining in, <laughs> right. then you're going to get condemned as working together with the KMT as well. So it's a really complex balancing act. But I think on a positive note, I think it's really exciting to see environmental issues really being discussed and not just swept under the carpet. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there was a, a survey I'd seen from the Taiwan Risk Society and Policy Research Center that found that 40% of survey respondents thought that nuclear was the primary source of energy in Taiwan, which I think there was a brief period of time in Taiwan's history where that was the case, but it hasn't been that way for decades. So I, I'm glad that the Green Party is kind of shifting that discourse window and you can, and that's like an opportunity to actually discuss what's going on with Taiwan environmentally because it's pretty opaque, you know, if you're just an average person. It's kind of unclear where Taiwan's energy comes from. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things that I think it was a feature of the referendum debates that we saw in 2018 as mm. well, that to what extent are these really judgments on the issues. To what extent is this just a matter of a big package? There's the key challenge for Green Party, but I think also the environmental movement. How do you kind of get your voices on the mainstream media? How do you influence mm. those that are beyond your kind of echo chambers? And is that, you know, related to the Green Party is not like a single issue party, like they're not only focused on the environment. What are the other political issues that they've historically supported. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that traditionally the Green Party has been quite diverse. So for example, I, I would say that gender has been a key issue, mm. particularly in the period after 2005, when a kind of new leadership emerges. So we see much more stress on LGBT rights, for example. We see the first openly gay candidates nominated by the party in 2010, which I think is an important moment, even though they don't actually get the first LGBT candidates elected. But I think being willing to kind of tackle issues that maybe other parties won't touch. Mm. For example, we saw discussion on euthanasia and medical use of cannabis in the 2020 campaign, right. which I think was, again, I'm pretty sure other parties wouldn't touch. Another one that at times has been raised is abolition of the death penalty. Oh yeah, massively controversial in Taiwan. That's right. And at times, I think even the Green Party has been a little bit cautious about that issue because it has been directly attacked. 
I remember there was a Facebook campaign against the party, I think in, maybe it was 20, 2012, about the death penalty. But I think Taiwan needs these kind of alternative voices. To a large extent, the party system has been dominated by KMT, DBP, and then its splinters. Right. Who are just kind of alternative versions of those two mainstream yeah. uh, parties. We like China a little less. We like China a little more, but, you know, <laughs> similar flavors. That's one of the things that makes Taiwan's party system today a little bit more interesting. The fact that movement parties can actually be competitive. Another way we can think about this is the way that the DVP has often poached Green Party figures. Ah. And it's been a uh, constant challenge for the party. And maybe that could be seen as a way of measuring success. Okay. The fact that mainstream parties need to kind of steal your influential figures and bring in the environmental issues into the kind of mainstream parties. Huh. It's kind of like a startup accelerator, you know, spinning up these candidates just to get purchased by, you know, Apple and Google, which in this case are the DPP and the KMT. Um, why has the Green Party in Taiwan not won or maybe done better in elections? Is it because of this poaching? Is it because of the fact that they're taking controversial issues? I mean, I think I agree with a lot of what Green Party Taiwan advocates for. You know, why isn't it more successful? Yeah, I, I think you're right that, I mean, one of the things that I try to argue in the book is that failure was never inevitable. Hmm. It was often a matter of perhaps choosing the wrong strategies not being inclusive enough, not being successful in its cooperation with other either mainstream or small parties. So I would say that if we just take the last two national elections, 2016 and 2020, I think if a slightly different approach had been taken, they perhaps could have got over that 5% mark. So I think a lot of it is down to strategic decisions. Interesting. Okay. So some sort of strategic problems. Before we get on to like the future prospects, I think something that listeners might be thinking about is, you know, do we really need green parties then? Shouldn't like every political party incorporate green ideology? I, you know, I, I'm from the U.S., so I think about Representative Ocasio-Cortez. You know, she pushed the Green New Deal. She's not in the Green Party and has arguably done a lot for green politics in the U.S. without ever being a part of this party. So not to say, do we really need green parties, but kind of like, what, what is their function then? Okay. I mean, we could look at this from different angles. I mean, one of them is if there wasn't a green party there, would these mainstream parties embrace these green issues? Hmm. One of the things we often find is that when the mainstream parties see the green parties as a threat, then they'll try to co-opt those issues. Interesting. It's definitely not such an issue in the US case, but I think that in a lot of European cases, that is a real factor. Of course, that raises challenges for the Green Party itself because your issue has been stolen. But mainstream parties often struggle to kind of live up to their promises right. because they have that need to deliver economic benefit. So, for example, when the DUP comes to power in 2000 under Chesrebien, it has a lot of environmental support, but very quickly, the environmentalists get quite disillusioned with Chen and the DVP because they need economic growth. Right. And that is one of the reasons why in the kind of second period of the Green Party's history, they're so distrustful of the DVP because they've been let down over nuclear power station, over environmental impact assessments. And that's why they've often found it quite difficult working with the DVP in that post-2000 era. But I think it's great to be able to kind of influence mainstream parties because they are the ones that are actually probably going to put these policies into practice. Mm. Uh, and I think the fact that the DBP still has, in theory, an anti-nuclear policy is a mark of success of the overall environmental movement in Taiwan. Yeah, definitely. I mean, certainly Thai power has no interest in building that fourth nuclear power plant despite all the referendums. And I also think that's a powerful lesson for people to take away that a relatively small, relatively underfunded, maybe let's say, political party is able to affect national change, you know, through bold events, standing in a missile site, you know, <laughs> or uh, taking these controversial stances. I think that's a lesson that's relevant for the whole world, really. You don't need to have this huge political mechanism. You can, you can still affect change. That's right. And I think the environmental groups, they have their role. But I think it's also quite important for them to have some kind of political representative. Mm. And I think that was one of the things that causes the party to be established in the first place. Of course, you will get environmentalists nominated by the mainstream parties, but they will also have to stick with party discipline. Right. That always tends to disappoint the environmentalists in the end. So I think it's definitely worth maintaining that kind of political representative goal. Yeah. And and I know that it's it's hard to predict the future, but the news today has been that Taiwan is talking about setting a 2050 
carbon neutrality or net zero carbon goal. So, you know, I think in light of that, what do we imagine for the future of the Green Party in Taiwan? There's these kind of big changes happening. How do we think the Green Parties in Taiwan will, will perform in the future? The next big test will be the 2022 local elections, which will be held, I think, in November 2022. What I found in the last few elections at the national level, 2012, 2016, was that the party collapses after not getting into parliament. Sort of the hangover after the election. <laughs> That's right. I mean, the mood when I first did those focus groups in December 2012 was pretty bad. People tend to disappear from the party after that setback. And the same was true after the 2016 setback. The mood in the party seemed better after 2020 because it was starting to rebrand and rebuild. Mm. But I think there's still a lot more that the party needs to do because it's a much more competitive market now for these alternative parties because you've got the new power party, you've got the state building party. Just having someone in parliament and having those government subsidies makes a difference. So I think there's a lot of things the party needs to do in the kind of the build up to 2022 in terms of recruitment, bringing back figures that have left the party, reconnecting with social movement groups, trying to regain that status as the real spokesperson for Taiwanese civil society. Winning elections in Taiwan is quite expensive. So you've got to put a lot of effort into fundraising and building up organizations, local party groups. Right. So there's a lot to be done. Uh, I mean, I finished the book on a relatively optimistic note. If I'd started the book in 2016, I probably would have ended up with a very pessimistic uh, <laughs> conclusion. But I'm, I'm hopeful because I think that they're moving in the right direction by reconnecting with civil society. But again, it's always this matter of getting a balance between winning elections but not selling your soul and staying true to your values. But it's really difficult. I think it's a difficult balancing act for any kind of Green Party, not just in Taiwan. How do you kind of get that balance? How to be competitive with the mainstream parties, but still maintain your kind of alternative brand? Yeah, that's that's essential. And I think if we can't figure that out, uh, we're going to have some real problems uh, in terms of climate change, pollution, everything else. Before we conclude, is there any one thing you want people to take away from your book? Is there any like one fact or one idea that you want people who read this book to walk away with? Um, I really hope that people will enjoy the human side of the Green Party, the way that people have sacrificed their time, their careers, their health for this struggle for environmental, but also social justice. I think for me, that's what makes this story really inspirational. There's a lot of things that international Green Parties or international environmental groups can learn from the Taiwan case, not just in the area of anti-nuclear, but also in terms of gender equality. And also party figures have played a key role in some of these key achievements, which I think make Taiwan a much better place. For example, Peng Yenwen, who was an early party figure, goes on to lead the Awakening Foundation which I think is a really remarkable organization. And others will go on to influence Taiwan in mainstream parties, people like Fan Yun, for example. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's been enlightening for me. You know, I've been exposed to green politics in Taiwan, but it didn't really occur to me until this conversation to think of them as, as not just a political party, but as like a social movement, as like a social organization. And I think that, you know, readers will get a lot out from your book if they're interested in party politics in Taiwan or just even even green politics. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're interested in both Taiwan's party system, but also civil society, it's kind of offers quite a different angle on Taiwan's history for the last 25 years or so. Uh, if readers are interested in buying the book, the first thing I would encourage you is to lobby your local library to get a, a copy. That way, more people can get access to ideally the ebook. But if you really want to get the book yourselves, you can find the book Taiwan's Green Parties on Amazon, Routledge.com, and I think perhaps books.com.tw. Okay. We'll put a link to that in the show notes so people can find it easily and ask their local libraries. Oh, yes, definitely. All right. Thanks for sharing with us today about your book, about your research, about green politics in Taiwan and abroad. What's next for you? Do you have another book? Are you going to do other political parties or is it more Green Party in the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, at the moment, one of the things we're working on is the Chinese version oh, interesting. of the book. I'm working together with a couple of former party leaders. 
But the idea is it won't be a direct translation of the book. The book will serve as the base of the Chinese version. But because the other two or maybe three are former party leaders, so they'll be bringing in their perspectives of elections, international Green Party engagement. So that's one of the things I'm quite excited about. But I'm still not sure about the next big project. Books take a long time. This one took me eight, nine years. So that decision is a really big one. <laughs> yeah. It's not quite like getting married again, but it's still a big decision. <laughs> yeah. Take your time, you know, read other books, see other magazines. You know, there's no, there's no rush. <laughs> uh, thanks again for talking with us, uh, Professor Fell. It was great. I learned a lot and I, I think our listeners will have a lot to take away from this. Thanks. It's a pleasure to have such an interesting discussion and particularly the fact that you've kind of seen this topic from quite different angles to me. That's made the conversation even more interesting. Yeah, it's been fun, Professor Fell. Let's talk again. You know, maybe when the referendums come around, we'll have a lot more to discuss. Yeah, definitely. Great. This has been a Ghost Island Media production based in Taipei, Taiwan. Today's episode was hosted by Nate Maynard for both The Taiwan Take and Waste Not, Why Not? To hear Nate's podcast, head over to Waste Not, Why Not? A part of the Ghost Island Media Network. Today's show is produced, researched, and edited by Yu Chen Lai with assistance from Elise Chen. Executive produced by me, Emily Waiwu. Thanks for listening. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>